Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, apologies, first of all, from, from Catherine. Um, I will not pretend to be Catherine White in the second part of my talk, so you can all relax. And um, I, I was, was going to say it's a bit like Bert and Ernie. Um, without Bernie, but that's a, perhaps a typical, <laughs> topical Northern Irish um, reference that shouldn't be filmed um, today. Um, I suppose what I'd like to say first of all is, is thank yous. Uh, an exhibition doesn't materialise out of thin air. It, it comes together um, from, from a number of places. Um, my interest in John Hewitt has, has come from really quite a, quite a strange place, and it's my interest in books and what we might be able to do with books. And a few years ago, uh, the University of Ulster allowed me to um, start a little digitization project. And, and that's how I met Catherine. And um, she did the digitization, and then suddenly, a few years later, here I am in Prony um, with an exhibition. Um, thanks to Prony, first of all, for allowing us to be here. Um, I, we have been annoying a number of the staff over the last few days in getting set up. Uh, thanks to Stephen and, and Gronia and Des as well, and numerous other people um, whose lives have been made slightly um, more hectic um, in the last while. Uh, the other major person to thank is John McMillan, the, the person who designed the exhibition, the, the real genius and guru behind um, what it looks like. So please do take some time to look around and, and enjoy it. <coughs> Homewards is quite a number of things. It's an exhibition, but it's also a project that looks at the life and career and collection of John Hewitt. It's about moving out of the classroom at times. It's about moving out of archives and meeting people and allowing people to gain access and awareness and a connection to John Hewitt's collection and work. To um, kind of participate in that work. Um, there's no point in having libraries and collections if people don't work out what's in them and what's being said. And, and it's wonderful to work along with Prony um, as part of this process. Um, as well as having an exhibition, we have done a number of outreach events and worked with a number of schools and we continue um, to do this. And if you have a connection with a school or a community group, and you want us to come and do a, a poetry workshop with those people, um, please do get in contact. At the heart of this project is Ulster writing and the writing of John Hewitt. This is the core thing, this is the driver, this is the thing that propels what we do, and it's that act of celebration and engagement and enjoyment in what John Hewitt said and did and left us. That is one of the key things that, that keeps us going as we go about um, our various parts of the project. And what he gives us is a sense of the homes in which he lived in. The places that he inhabited, the landscapes that were his, and the landscapes which gave him a sense of his identity and a sense of who he was in the world and who we might be as well in the world. How we might discover our own voices, how we might discover a way into writing and poetry that is our own. John Hewitt's estate um, through Keith Miller allowed us access to family photographs that hadn't been seen before. And this was an amazing privilege because we got to see through the eyes of John Hewitt in his domestic settings, to see where he actually lived, what he saw. Almost at times it was as, as if he was in the room, um, not just in the room in terms of what he said in his poetry, but in the room through how he visualized his very existence in his home. So we were um, deeply, deeply privileged to share in this. John Hewitt didn't have a loud voice, but he had a voice that you listen to. One of the poems which Catherine and I have kind of used as our mission statement was one of John Hewitt's own um, mission statements, I write for. 
I write for my own kind. I do not pitch my voice that every phrase be heard by those who have no choice. Their quality of mind must be withdrawn and still as moth that answers moth across a roaring hill. Northern Ireland has given us numerous roaring hills in the last thousand years. But John Hewitt spoke quietly against that rage, against that noise, and has left us thousands of poems which offer possibility, potential, ways into understanding ourselves that we perhaps haven't even grasped yet. <clears throat> the exhibition is a coming together of three archives. Firstly, the archive at the University of Ulster, his poems, his manuscript collections, his books, um, his various other things, his 20 odd box loads of material that moved from Stockman's Lane after his death to the University of Ulster. And I, I get the feeling that Crony also has approximately um, a similar amount of, uh, of information to deal with. So the exhibition draws on the University of Ulster collection. It draws on the family collection, an amazing collection of photographs, a life in pictures um, from a young man in the cricket team to an old man gazing out at the lagoon. We have Hewitt's life in these pictures. And we have a Hewitt that we perhaps didn't necessarily see before. A John Hewitt who had fun, who played about, who enjoyed himself, who was unguarded in his moments um, in his family setting. And of course, we have the magnificent Prony collection, some of the images we have. This is one of my favorite ones. Um, greetings, Mrs. John Hewitt, YMCA Central Club, um, Russell Street, London. Busy, but remembering love, Johnny. <laughs> Incredible, intimate, kind moments from a life which um, we have in the exhibition. As I said, exhibitions and projects are not just about academic settings. They're not just about having talks to people. They're going out into the world and meeting and working with people who've never heard of John Hewitt. Um, we spent um, a good part of um, June working with Coleraine College and um, with um, 13 and 14 year olds who had never heard of John Hewitt, who had never heard of Seamus Heaney, um, but who were blank pages because I asked them, what does a poet look like? And they said, well, he's an old guy with a pipe and glasses and a beard. <laughs> it's John Hewitt. <laughs> um, can anybody be a poet? Yes. You just need imagination. These were great uh, pupils to work with. Um, they did amazing work. They, they wrote everything from Ulster Scott's haikus to mini, and they wrote some brilliant Ulster Scott's haikus as well, I can tell you, uh, to mini sagas. Um, they were great. Uh, the other group that we worked with is, is a group from the old park um, who have now put a playground um, where John Hewitt's um, original house used to be. It's a sign of hope in an area which is in an interface, which um, struggles with a number of problems. But even there, the John Hewitt Play Park offers a symbol of hope in times of a quite dreadful, a, a quite dreadful place. And, and it's been our real privilege to um, take part and help out with, with this group as well. Um, one of um, Hewitt's poems about his childhood when he remembers um, the games that he played as a child. I had no idea what these games were, but a group of pensioners were able to explain every single game that Hewitt had played as a child. And these people quite possibly may well even have seen John Hewitt as a child. So there were incredible um, meetings and, and days um, with various groups. The project, in a sense, never ends. Um, once you kind of work at the University of Ulster, hopefully you never get away from it. Um, we are continuing the, the work that John did. Sorry folks, we have had a problem with our audio over the last few days. So if Frank 
if you just it's, show it. It's, it's my high electric magnetism, which um, <laughs> does dreadful things. I'm not allowed on planes, and um, you know, what can you do? Uh, I just shout at you. It's just like a proper University of Ulster lecture. Um, there are a number of things that we're doing. Uh, one of the things is the Ulster Scots Education Project, where we're using some of John Hewitt's collection to um, go around schools and, and create materials um, for schools that, that explain what the Ulster Scots tradition that John Hewitt was a pioneer in helping save and preserve, um, to ex actually explain what that is. Uh, and we have a number of other things ongoing, um, which we we'll hope to tell you about at some stage. <coughs> the collection at the University of Ulster had John Hewitt's autobiography, a kind of mythic thing to some people in Irish writing. Um, here you had John Hewitt's life story, and yet it was unpublished. You had his telling of what he had done in his life, and yet no one had come along and published it. Uh, and a few years ago, um, Catherine and I were, were kind of saying, oh, um, uh, and since she's not here today, I'll take credit, but it's probably her. Um, uh, why don't we publish this? Why don't we let people hear about his life uh, and what he did um, from, from, his own, um, from his own mouth? Hewitt is often seen as the poet, the grand elder statesman of Northern writing, the person who inspired Heaney, who inspired Longley, who was kind of like a father hen to the, that bright generation in the 1960s. And yes, that's true. He did all that. He was there. He did these things. But we tend to forget that Hewitt did a lot of other things before 1965. One of the things that he did that we tend to forget is that he acted as a kind of collector for art in his job at the Ulster Museum. He went about and effectively brought together that collection. So what we may see as art in this part of the world has been inspired, has been gathered together by John Hewitt. And his autobiography, A North Light, is about the coming to terms of what art means in our lives and what it meant particularly in his life. It's also about the younger man. Um, a poet is not a man, I know there are certain men in the room with glasses and beard and perhaps a pipe, um, but you're not all poets. You just have to accept that. And John Hewitt, you may well, but John Hewitt was a young man and Northlight captures that essence of the young, angry man, the man who was friends with Orwell, who went to see Hugh McDermott, who went to see the great and the good in his generation. He was not somebody who was crusty and angry and withdrawn. He was not the man who somehow didn't get the job that he wanted at the um, Ulster Museum and ran away to Coventry. He took a long, long time <coughs> To run away. He took four or five years to run away. Um, he didn't run away. He went and got a better job. He went and did amazing exhibitions in Coventry, which we haven't even thought about or, or looked into yet. <coughs> he talked to the important people of his generation. His friendship with John Luke is an inspirational friendship of the painter and the poet connecting over what the world is and how it should look and how it should feel. And there's, there's a magnificent letter from Luke which is in Prony. And if you do one thing today, go up and look at this letter because John Luke explains a grey sky to John Hewitt. You may think this is really boring, but in terms of art and visualization and actually seeing what there is to see in life. This is an amazing um, piece of writing, amazing kind of, kind of connection between two of the most important people of their generation. And Luke painted things like the old Callum Bridge um, in Armagh, part of Hewitt's ancestral homes, 
Um, Hewitt had a number of ancestral homes. He, he liked to think he, some of these were in Scotland, some of these were in England, um, some of these were in the Glen, some of these were in Belfast. Hewitt's homes um, ranged across a number of places because he could contain the concept that he belonged to more than one place, that he owed allegiance to more than one um, group or identity. And Hewitt was not necessarily the crusty figure that we perhaps sometimes associate him with. Um, there's a great story of Brendan Bain bringing him up one night um, drunk, um, much the worse for wear, um, somewhere in the falls, uh, and Hewitt brings him into his house and dusts off the only bottle of Guinness that he has under the sink. And the two of them find connection, find things to talk about, um, find um, a place in which they can both speak to each other. And in Northlight, is John Hewitt speaking to us? Uh, one of the things that we find on the project that he recited the, the whole book to himself practically. So that it's not something that he wrote, that he, he put it together in little vignettes, little short um, amazing chapters in which he sums up his life and where he was and what he did. And the other great thing is apparently these spools of magnetic tape still exist and we're hoping that they haven't decomposed too much but we might be able to recapture these uh, and use them um, in our continuing work. You can't get away from the people you study. You think that they're just books. You think they're just an archive, just a collection. But they get into your life. They get into the way you look at things. They get into um, your own sense of being. And John Hewitt has done that uh, to Catherine and to myself. He has given us ideas. He has told us things. He has directed us to places. He has stood as a potential um, guide, as a symbol of hope. And this is really why we did the exhibition, so that this symbol of hope, this voice, this quiet voice from the past may not be forgotten, but can speak to us all again, and we can listen. Thank you. It's my great pleasure to um, welcome Frank Sewell to speak today. Um, it, it's a great pleasure to know poets. Um, it, it's a great pleasure to know particular poets like Frankie. Um, I, I, I don't need to, to sort of boast of, of, of his abilities. Um, a bit like John Hewitt, he, he doesn't boast of his abilities. He just writes good poetry. And there's nothing else that I need to say other than um, I welcome you very much to speak to us today. Just in case you don't like my poetry, I'm going to read the one by John Hewitt. Uh, in preparation for this gig, of course, I've been thinking about Hewitt again. And uh, not that I've forgotten him, but other things crowd the mind. Um, but I did study Hewitt's poetry uh, in year three, I think it was, at my degree at Queen's University, where I was taught by Edna Longley. And uh, Hewitt made a great impression on me. I actually chose to write one of my essays uh, about him. And at the time, I loved uh, a particular poem that he wrote called Coasters. It's one of the, maybe one of the angry young men, very left-wing Orwellian type poems, uh, where he criticizes the bourgeoisie. <laughs> As a young, sort of angry young man myself, I enjoyed that poem a lot. But as time has gone by, another poem has come to mean a lot more to me, and it's called Gloss on the Difficulties of Translation. Now, one reason why this means a lot to me is I know about the difficulties of translation. I am a translator for my sins. Um, this poem has also become uh, kind of a key poem for, I think, all Ulster poets. Um, in it, it begins with a translation actually by Hewitt himself, of the 9th century Irish poem, The, the Lagging Blackbird, that we all know. And 
Uh, at Queen's University now, they've taken the yellow nib as a kind of theme. It's become the title of a magazine there. So these are all indications in some ways of uh, the longevity of that very poem, but also Hewitt's influence, you know, Hewitt's translation of that poem uh, and his gloss on it, this poem by Hewitt himself, has come to mean a lot, I think, to the generations after Hewitt. But that's more than enough, I'd rather read the poem. Across Loch Lee, the yellow-billed blackbird whistles from the blossomed wind. Not, as you might expect, a Japanese poem, although it has the 17 syllables of the haiku. Ninth century Irish, in fact, from a handbook on metrics, the first written reference to my native place. In 40 years of verse, I have not inched much further. I may have matched the images, but the intricate wordplay of the original, assonance, rhyme, alliteration, is beyond my grasp. To begin with, I should have to substitute golden for yellow and gorse for wind. This last is the word we use on both sides of Belfast Loch. This poem tells us a lot about Hewitt, the wideness of his reading. He was reading a book about Irish poetry in Irish and from many centuries before. Um, he knew where it came from, he knew that it was from a book of metrics. So he was really studying this material, um, having the sort of cultural openness to do so. Um, you see also his modesty, he says he hasn't inched much further. You know, he th he's basically saying he can't match this stuff. But, and that was a trait of Hewitt's, that sort of <coughs> modesty. So he's very aware of the difference of cultures, but he also comes back paradoxically to the unity of them. On both sides of Belfast Lock, we would use a word like win. So that's a, that's a very important poem, I think, to me and to many other Ulster writers. Um, I noted one of the slides had the word home, and very aptly it had a question mark after it. Home question mark. Because I think we all, including Hewitt, have a, at least a dual, probably a multiple relationship with our home place. Odi et amo, love and hate for it, and many other feelings in between. Um, this is a poem that reflects some of that. Not knowing where you stand is where you stand. Always wanting to put your foot down on dry land and not finding it, or when you do, not standing it. Sailing on until you change your mind, turn back and find it gone. Is it under a pebble or stone, scooped up and dropped into the ocean? Your one and only chance, which when recognized as such, hightails it. Where do you stand when you're too far gone to judge, land from sea or sea from land? Seamus Heaney talks about a, a phrase from up his part of the country where they say, so there you are, and where are you? The uncertainty of place. Um, another thing I like about Hewitt is that when he writes about places, they're off the beaten track places. You know, he doesn't write about London, Dublin, Berlin even. He writes about Ballinure, you know, uh, odd places, Dresden, maybe. Not really surprisingly, but Dresden, you know. He doesn't write about the capitals, in other words, it's the small places. And I, I mightn't have been conscious of it, but I think he's influenced me because I, I remember pointedly taking a delight in writing a poem called Crumlin. I don't know if anybody else it has. So Crumlin. Crumlin, some kind of bend or stoop. For me, a place where the train pulls up and unnoticed the ghost of you slips into the carriage through my open lips and under my skin, back where you belong, but will not stay. By Glenavy, you're gone. Next stop, Belfast, the farset mouth closed to us, all of those deadly mementos, old haunts where it hurts now to go or to look up at an empty window. A day, two at most, and I return to Korean, 
out back, far corner of fern, and again have to pass through Crumlin. How can I ever get round you, woman? Wipe Crumlin like a crumb off the map, hijack the train and never let it stop, blow the whistle and just shoot on past the platform, people and prams. Not so fast. With the seven powers invested in me, by Crumb's three hags of the long teeth, I'll crumple Crumlin down into a speck, thrice bound inside a haversack, with lace from a girl's red DM boot, the rolled gold wristwatch of King Canute, and the bobble he bunched her hair with once. Now it is worse than it ever was. The train misses out Glenavy to Antrim, and I feel like there is something wanting, something lost that cannot be regained, spirited away like the R in Crumlin. With an exhibition called Home Words, I can't maybe not read this poem. I wanted almost to censor it, but I can't not read it. It's maybe one poem where I most openly meditated on the word home. And again, that's, you know, I know that poetry is a minority sport. It's really nice that so many of you have come out. Uh, but poetry is a minority sport. Hewitt is valuable uh, in more ways than his poetry is led. He's, a, he's an old-fashioned man of letters, a thinker, a visionary. He, he can be read for all of those things, you know. I say that for the non-poetry people. Um, so this is a poem, as I say, it's a reflection on home. And I guess sometimes the question of home seems like an old one. So I call this poem a rusty dagger. And it's take, that's taken from a quote by uh, a phrase from Louis McNeese, who said about home, Ode et que amo, I hate but I also love. Shall we cut this name on trees with a rusty dagger? I have stayed by my mind, been ready for the off and changed my mind. This will make you laugh. I planned my exile in Stirling, first of all, leaving one Celtic mile for another. The soil of the Saxon foe was no go. No go at all in the end. I stayed behind and half lived it, bomb by bomb. And still what is meant by home, I can't fathom. The people on the road, am I theirs? Are they my own? Who the hell cares? They don't, so why? Home, home. We kick it around like a stone and go back at Christmas, but it never works. The knives and forks are set against us. The family reunion, the national anthem, the Queen's speech, the papal visit. Just go to show what a misfit you are, what a wretch, and how much you aren't home. by reading something that reflects the present and the sort of plurality. I mean, that's the great thing about it, if I haven't said it already. What a pluralist he was, you know. What an inclusive type of thinker uh, and a generous man he was. He had so many friends and he was such a friend to them. You see that in the signed books that were given to him by James Simmons and Heaney and McGuckian and others. Um, so, there's many things we can learn from them, but that sort of pluralism <coughs> is maybe chief among them. And this is a, a, a poem with a title, a plural number anyway, 167 plus. 167 plus languages in Ireland. Not one, not two, but 167 plus 
languages in Ireland, from Ashanti to Visaya, Chechen to Diula, Iwi to Farsi, Georgian to Hausa, Itsekiri to Japanese, Kinyarwanda to Lango, Mono to Ndibele, Oromo to Pushto, Roma to Shelta, Tsonga to Arhobo, Vietnamese to Wolof, Yiddish to Zagawa, 167 plus languages, and still they are counting, from Derry to Dingle, from Bray to the Burren, in Galtacts, Gaeltacts, and Brack Vieltacts, where Zulu is spoken, and a holly welcome, an A to Z, and a Z to A, of tongues dancing down at the crossroads, where all the signs in Irish, English, and Ulster Scots declare that Ireland, at long last, is taking its place once again among the nations of the world and the nations of the world among the Irish. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Frank. That's an honour to actually listen to that. Um, it was a great pleasure. And I, I'd like to finally welcome our, our desk and Kate um, for what I think will also be a very reflection. A <coughs> um, few words. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I have a little thing done up, and uh, depending on time, I'll, I'll put it up. It, 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 might be, it might be interesting. Um, uh, actually, I, I had a kind of a, there was a kind of funny omen, a, a nice omen this morning. I was trying to put something together, and the phone rang <coughs> for um, the fellow beside me, Ian Montgomery. And uh, I answered it, and you know, Ian's not around, he's, he's, he's just out. Um, he should be in later. And I said, who did I say called? And uh, guess who called? John Hewitt. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that wasn't, obviously, but that's true. Anyway, um, Hewitt was an activist as well as a poet. And his poetry was a kind of activism. It was emotional thinking. Um, listening to uh, both of what you said, you could feel very strongly that um, po he, he, he wrote about his poetry was trying to find a kind of solution to something which he couldn't quite find a name to, and he was stubbornly refused any easy solution, because it wasn't going to be a solution which said, I'm not interested in identities as such, in other words, a kind of a transnational cosmopolitan solution. It was going to be some, something different. He probably never found it, but I think he gave us something constructive to work towards it. And that's kind of, it's, it's quite interesting. Now, he was an activist holding to a cause in the sense that all of his life he was, as they say, committed, as they used to say in the 1930s, to left-wing ideals. In his own case, he remained staunchly communist until late in life. Late in life. His activism was expressed, along with, with, with Roberta, his wife, in energetic party organization in Coventry and here in Edinburgh, in workers' education, and in a certain amount of placard attendance at demonstrations against nuclear bombs, Cold War militarisms, all these kind of political issues. And additionally, by the communication of forthright political opinions in articles and newspaper correspondence. Now this was going along, in a sense, this was very genuine uh, politics. Now in a period when most intellectuals were left-wing anyway, it was fairly commonplace, Hewitt was probably a bit more single-minded in his expression than most, and his politics didn't really become dilute by the end of his life. I and mean, the spenders, the audience, they wavered, they changed, they... Possibly their politics was a little bit more modish. Um, although in his youth, his teachers saw his future in the world of art, and this turned out, of course, to be a very accurate prediction, he was determined also to marry aesthetics with political principle. There's always perhaps a faint touch of the absurd about strong-minded communists making a pretty good living in arts administration. Um, and in practice, you could possibly say he was maybe more of an idealistic administrator than a confrontational agitator. I'm only just making that as a side point. Actually, it was an interesting thing as well. You showed the picture of Hewitt as, an, as a young man. I was just walking past that downstairs the other day, and I thought, God, that reminds me of somebody. I know it reminds me of somebody. It's, it, actually, it looks incredibly like Michael Collins. 
has it to just what a chin. He even has there's a picture of Michael Collins with a small moustache, around about 1919. Anyway, he wasn't a revolutionary like that. Thank God, he was more constructive. By and large, art and political activism have tended to be seen as uneasy partners. There are many examples of right-minded politics having a sterile effect on poetic practice during the 1930s and 1940s, until the fashion for so-called commitment died in the equally questionable apocalyptic fervor of the late 1940s. In, Hew in Hewitt's case, his poetry was always saved from modish dullness, first by his sincerity, <clears throat> which even in a poet, I think, has a good deal of merit, but has to be the right kind of sincerity, a sort of joking sincerity, in my opinion. <laughs> I don't know what to, what to think. And by his capacity for self-questioning. And further, perhaps, by the decency of his confusions. He wanted a purer and more intense life for people in Northern Ireland, and he felt that somehow his own life and thought would make more sense if that could be achieved. That's my own instinct, looking at it. These are the kind of simple things that actually affect very complicated, sophisticated people. They don't necessarily put it in those terms, but actually that's what's going on. So it was more about community and human relationship than economic well-being. His Marxism was more about cure for alienation of spirit, perhaps what Marx was about, than about crop yields, five-year plans, and social engineering. In fact, his Marxism was likely in practice to have been rather subversive of the regimes in Eastern Europe that he visited in the 1960s. And he was too romantic at heart, not to say too truthful, to deny the meaningful reality of identity or the need for such meaning, the human need for such meaning. Although he formally approved of the industrialized communist societies he visited around Eastern Europe in the 1960s on account of the social equity he believed they represented, and that was fundamentally the reason he was communist, that's obviously an important way of getting towards a solution in his home in, his home in Northern Ireland. Um, he, uh, he emotionally, he felt he belonged to a people and a land. And that's a complicated relationship. This runs through all of his poetry, and it's not the language or thinking of a technocratic utopian, communist or otherwise. So for all the praise he lavished on places he visited in the 1960s, which you can read in our correspondence, the kind of society he really yearned for was really something like the craft agricultural society reflected in the Ulster Scots poetry of the late 18th and early 19th century. He wasn't going to make a case for this vision, a little bit difficult, possibly to be mocked, but in practice the act of bringing these poets back into public attention had a greater effect on the public mood and feeling than any political tract might have had. Hughes was a thinker. His poetry, I think, was emotional thinking. That's one of the things about it. It's, it's, it and it was emotional thinking because his thought was rooted in his emotions. It wasn't philosophical thinking. He couldn't stop thinking about certain things, and he had to solve them emotionally. And he kept trying to get closer to an emotional solution, um, while in Northern Ireland and while in Coventry. Now, Prony doesn't hold drafts or versions of his poems, but the papers we hold are extremely important evidence for the development and the impact of his thought. The archive was gathered and deposited in Prony, according to the terms of his will, by his nephew, Keith Miller, in 1988, a year after his death. It comprises some 7,000 documents and volumes relating to Hewitt's career and his creative achievement, and a great deal of this is relevant to the career, and a great deal of other relevant material uh, relating to the career and life of Roberta Black, his wife. Um, the numbers are impressive. There's about 115 official and legal papers belonging to the couple, 37 diaries and travel notebooks, and three scrapbooks containing reviews, photographs, and published essays and correspondence. Like any writer, he couldn't help himself. He did cut out his reviews. And he was very sensitive about these things. Um, then there's over a thousand letters between John Hewitt and friends, colleagues and partners in creativity, such as the poets W.R. Rogers, Gordon Bottomley, Austin Clark, Seamus Heaney, the painters John Luke and Colin Middleton, and the folklorist, is kind of interesting, Michael J. Murphy. Then there's another two and a half thousand miscellaneous items of correspondence, which are fascinating. It's unfortunate that there's little direct correspondence by Hewitt known to have survived in general, but we're lucky in Prony to be furnished with a lengthy run of letters from Hewitt to Dr. Patrick, Robert Patrick Mayben, a friend of his youth with whom he discussed poetry and political ideas from the 1940s to the 1970s. Uh, Mayben was, was very left-wing, similar politics, 
very enthusiastic about the foundation of the welfare state, and uh, they had a very, very enthusiastic correspondence. Mabin was over in, Eng went over in England, I had to come back and work here. Uh, anyway, the, most of the correspondence relates to the 1940s to the 1970s. The political activism of Roberta Hewitt is also well covered. The archive has been researched by a number of scholars, but it's still a treasured resource and rewards further study. I think there's a lot more to go. Now Hewitt, I'm going to go a little bit into this one aspect of it. He was a thinker who wanted his home place changed. And I'm always, I'm interested in this, now obviously you can hear I'm from the South. But I think the Ulster question is also the Irish question. And it, it's an emotional thing, as much as anything. And so the kind of things that Hughes was going on about, they make sense to me. I can, those issues actually are alive to, to me. And they're alive to actually a lot of people in the South too. And the question of minority languages. These are real things, which, which we, we, he dealt with very fairly and very perseveringly. And I think there's a huge amount more. He kept bringing back attention. I, I think, for instance, we tend to try and solve our problems nowadays by a kind of um, technological extingu extinguishing of identity and individuality. We can just have a rational system in which actually individual difference doesn't matter. Individual feelings don't matter. There may have been a tiny amount of sincerity in this, although there's, there's not a great deal of sincerity in it. But I don't think this is the final human answer to the kind of problems of identity that exist in the world. And I think Hewitt stubbornly resisted that kind of thing, even though formally he was a communist. Emotionally, he didn't really believe that would work. He wanted something else. He couldn't quite put words to it. Now, whatever change was going to happen, I think he emotionally felt would involve going back as much as going forward. And in the poetry of the Ulster Scots Weavers, he felt a local immediacy and an intimacy with place and people without which no true community could develop. It's not unusual for good poets to remain unknown or relatively unknown until somebody makes us listen properly to them. So people might say, well, you know, Ulster Scots poets, you know, if they were any good, we all have heard of them before. Actually, loads poets are hardly known until actually somebody begins to say, well, Jamie Hopkins, <laughs> somebody should have published him a long time ago, or Christopher Smart, or lots of others. So he's, these are very, very good poets. And he knew what he was talking about when he published them. And he wouldn't have published stuff that wasn't any good. Now, one of the things, and that's what Hewitt managed to do for the circle of mostly Presbyterian writers in the late, 19th and early, late 18th and early 19th century. One of the things that shines out from such poetry is that much of its vibrancy draws strength from the vibrancy of the unsophisticated folk culture where these writers grew up. This is very obvious in the poetry of Burns. Now, Hewitt was aware that not only was the distinctive language dying out or dead from neglect or virtually and inattention, but also that the deeper body of folk custom, lore, and narrative was, was on the point of extinction if it wasn't gone. Now, we're well aware today of the Gaelic folk world but we have paid very little heed to the distinctive and overlapping Ulster Scots folk world, which nourished the language itself, and was indeed part of it, and which wasn't studied in time, in, because for, 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 for nationalistic political reasons, and for better reasons than that, in the 1930s, the Irish Folklore Commission was set up in Dublin and went out and grabbed and soaked up everything got to do with the Irish language all over the country. So there's a vast amount of stuff that's actually like raw material for the Gaelic heritage in Dublin, as it, it, it comes out all the time. There was just as rich a body of lore in Ulster Scots areas, but it wasn't really even acknowledged. And, but Hewitt was aware of it. And this all comes across in correspondence held by Crony between Hewitt and the um, indefatigable Armagh folklorist, Michael J. Murphy, in the 1950s and 1960s. This is a very large correspondence and reflects his ongoing passion for local knowledge and folklore. He was looking at the Weaver poets, but he wanted language and he wanted lore. Murphy was one of the very few folklore scholars of the period to have gathered material all over Northern Ireland, and he passed on to Hewitt some of the dialect words and turns of phrase he assembled over decades. 
Um, he commented in one letter that the folk world he knew had faded like the morning dew. Now he did a lot of work in the glens of Antrim, and it's clear that Hewitt and himself swapped stories and sayings. There was a nice, there's a very nice story where you know Hewitt, Hewitt was always keen to know what Murphy had come up with, and he'd try and get him stuff and send it back. And there's a great story that Hewitt came. There's a couple of little things that I noticed. There's one nice story of um, Ulster Scots fishermen fishing off Malin Head, and Somebody, there was, a, there was a few of them in a boat, and one of them said, oh, I sold the pig yesterday. And they oh my God, you can't say pig. And the fellow tried to touch a bit of iron, but said, no, it's no use, you can't touch iron. We're just going to have to get you back onto the shore and we'll keep fishing on our own, because we're not going to catch any fish, because you started speaking about pigs. And um, again, because of the way things developed, like when, when I do that, I think, well, that's the sort of thing I'd expect was just part and parcel of, you know, Gale talk life, and you associate it with, you could say, the Gaelic world. You don't, you don't necessarily associate it so much with the Ulster Scots thing. In fact, personally, I would have thought, well, these were probably Presbyterian and very hardline, and they wouldn't have any truck with that sort of thing. I was talking to you about that the other day. But of course, it's not like, it wasn't like that at all. There was a huge body of lore, and it, it hasn't developed, or hasn't been uh, picked up on. But Hewitt was aware of it. He also mentions a nice thing about when, say, when, when your parents die, it was tradition that the eldest male child would, it's kind of a bit gruesome, but the eldest male child would be the first one to turn the sod, or would, as I said, leave his weight on the spade uh, when they're filling in the grave. Now, as it happens, I can remember my uncle doing that for his grandfather down in Coron in, um, in Athol. And it was very, he, he kind of pushed away the grave diggers and he just took the spade and he started, you know, and I, it was quite dramatic. But it was obviously quite a common thing. Um, now, the living reality of the Ulster Scots folk world, I've got a couple of little things that I, I just wanted to get a couple of little things uh, that you would have known about uh, in a different way, but they'll kind of get across some of the, 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 the reality of what I'm talking about. The living reality of the Ulster Scots folk world has receded from view, hopefully temporarily, but I found a fascinating snapshot of such daily knowledge and memory in the well-known autobiography of Mickey McGowan um, of Guidor. This is Rotten War and Sylvie, which came out, it came out in the early 1960s, but it was collected, transcribed in the 1940s. He died in 1948, this guy, he was born in 1966, and he grew up in Guidor, <coughs> went off to the Lagan area, which is more than what we know of the lagging now, to work as a young boy, hiring out to herd out to farmers. And then he eventually went up in America and went to the Klondike, and it's a big thing. But anyway, <clears throat> for interest's sake, about 1874, all the boys of the villages were making for Letterkenny for the hiring fair. In those days, the people of the lagging were looking for boys that would herd and give a bit of service around the house, and for bigger boys that would help in the agricultural work. I hadn't reached my tenth year by then. At the fair, I was running around on my own and having little conversations in English with the Lagan people. Now, these were all Ulster Scots farmers. And it's, it's very interesting stuff because you, it, it, it's stuff that just opens your, certainly opened my mind. Uh, their accent and idiom was hard to follow. It wasn't the same as what the master who taught me at school had. When they'd be talking about boys like myself, bairns they'd call them. One man was telling about a horse that took fright as she, being, as she was being led to the fair that morning. And what he said was that the animal was cope and curly. Another man averred that he was sagged with the rheumatics and that we were lucky to have such a brave day. When I heard all this and a lot more, I was of the opinion that it would be just as easy for them to understand my Irish as it would be for me to make head or tail of their English. To make a long story short, I was hired to a man from Dromachal called Sam Dove, a fine, well-built man with a red forehead and a large hooked nose. But if he was big, he was kindly too, and there was no more harm in him than there would be in a child. This is all its translated. Dromachal is about five miles from the Lifford side of Letterkenny. There's fine country all round there, and it's good growing country as you'll get in Ireland. In my day, it was all Scotsmen who, lived, who were there, but I heard that it has changed. He stayed with Sam and his sister Jane on the farm. Uh, it was a, a wild, buckety place. I fell in with the strange habits of Sam and Jane, and the hardship didn't worry me too much. They were kind enough. Come Sunday morning, if I wasn't up myself, They'd call me and tell me it was time to dress myself to go to the kirk, as they call the church. 
In a way, I'm reading this out because I know Hewitt would have been interested in it. So that's why I read it out. So I, that's why I think it would actually be interesting to yourselves. Um, as a result, when I grew older and I went out in the world, my respect for the old pair grew. Now and again, there'd be great nights of storytelling and a wealth of tales would be told. There was one old man in particular called Billy Craig who came visiting regularly, and I can't tell you the number of stories he had. He'd have been nearing, eight, nearing 80 at the time, and he was one of those who spent the early part of his life going around the province of Ulster, ploughing in the springtime. He had a great reputation as a ploughman. I think it was because of all his wandering that he had the gift of storytelling. Now, I often heard people say that since then that the Scots had no lore or superstitions, but I can tell you they're wrong. Billy Craig had a huge amount of lore and stories, just like our own people, and he was as superstitious as any of the old people that you'd ever meet. And he was just comparing them to the people he knew in Guidor. Sam and Jane were just the same. When Billy would come to the house at twilight, he'd get his back at the corner, and if the king himself was to come in, he wouldn't move from there until bedtime. He was a heavy smoker, and when he'd get the pipe going, he wouldn't, he wouldn't be silent as long as there was anyone to listen to him. There was no kind of storytelling that he didn't know something about, but he specialised in stories about ghosts and the little people. <clears throat> it's likely enough that he believed in ghosts because he was to stay till morning. He would never leave the house without a companion, although he lived only a short distance away. I heard him say that the little people left the district we were in, he reckoned, about 20 years beforehand. So I reckon that about 1855, that's when he reckoned the fairies left the area around Lifford, the hinterland of Lifford. He said he was very friendly with an old woman, Curly Mary Hamilton, to whom the little people would come now and then, and they told her the night she'd be leaving the place. They said the fairy hosts of Connacht had declared war on them, and they had to go and fight them. If they lost, the well from which she drew water would be red with blood in the morning. And that's what happened, and so she knew they were going to go. There was no end to the stories that Billy had about this airy throng. Stories about everything pertaining to them. People they helped, people they hurt, people they took away and who never returned. People who felled trees or bushes in some sacred place and who never did any good afterwards. People who built houses in forbidden places, people who threw water on the doorstep and were advised not to be trying to drown the fairies. I can remember all that stuff. <clears throat> My mother used to have this thing where you say, tea the way, and never you'd throw water out the door, that sort of stuff. People who learned music from them and people who didn't like their music and whom they turned into hunch hunchbacks. Many of the night I spent listening to these stories about fairies and ghosts. I said that Jane, Sam and Jane were superstitious, and that's nothing but the truth. I saw Sam tying a red tassel round the neck of a calf that he was letting out for the first time. I saw Jane take a piece of fresh butter out of the churn and stick it to the wall over the cattle. She did this to save the milk from evil charms. And of course, there was a horseshoe on the door of the cowhouse with the heel part upwards. I thought nobody paid any attention to these customs except at home in Guidor, but I was finding out that the people in the lagoon were, if anything, more superstitious and knowledgeable than our own. Be that as it may, I stayed there till stay November. And he stayed about five years there, went off to Scotland, went on. But it's a fascinating extract, and it tells you a huge amount. There's a lot more there, a lot more that I think if you knew about that, that would have stimulated him to a lot of poems too, I think. And it would have actually meant that he was on the right track in his, in his kind of sense of how to go about things. Now, to finish off, there's another thing that I think might be of interest. It's a French poem which Anita, my wife, translated. And the thing about, you see, the reason I'm talking about this, really, forget this, is because language is political. And why is it political? It's not political because you can stick it on a banner and you say, well, I own this language, you don't own it, it belongs to me, or whatever. It's political because it's about understanding. There's no language that actually doesn't have understanding. So if you learn a language, then you're coming to an understanding with the speakers. Suddenly, it's political because it's beyond politics. It's about community and life. And if you don't pay attention to what are called minority languages like Ulster Scots that you were so concerned about and knew was important, then you're not paying attention to people and you're never going to get real community. And any amount of electoral politics won't solve any problems. Now, of course, the same thing went on all over Europe. And in France, the local languages were attacked by this central state. They were given no credence. And, but this is a nice poem by a fellow called Miguel Zamasois, 1910. He's a southern Frenchman, and he had a proud sense of his own language. And um, 
de l'accent, de l'accent, les apps et tout, en jeu, pourquoi cette faveur, pourquoi ce privilège Accent, ha, accent, dialect, du, dialect. Have I really got one? What about it then? Perhaps it's a privilege. And maybe if I told you, people of the north, that, that, that's the Parisians, that it's you who seem to us to have the brogue trade for. But we say of you lot, from the Rhone to the Gironde, them people there don't speak normal like. Uh, hang on now. I get that. How do we get the next one? Right, Arrow. All right. Anyhow, I'm tired getting on. I can only pity those who haven't got an accent. And I don't really have an accent. I've just got a South County Dublin middle class accent. <laughs> to carry or bear these homely, barbarous sounds is to carry the good earth from home as we do the rounds. To sport the accent of Brittany or that of the Auvergne, it's a bit like carrying a bit of more and rat or the dark clay of the urn. When far from home with heavy heart you flee, it's big problem. Your accent is a bit of home that follows thee. This accent, it is our invisible luggage, the hamely tongue that we carry as we wander. And for those unhappy emigrants into forced exile, it's the gloss that rubs off in every newfangled word, word in a little while. To have an accent at the end of the day is to speak of your part of this land in every little thing you say. <laughs> that was a whole. Uh, that's about all I have to say, but I think it's a nice little thing.